Look at Titus chapter 2. We're going to start there in our study in Titus chapter 2. We're continuing our look verse by verse through our Apostle Paul's book of Titus. Last week we left off in in verse 13. So I'm going to read 13, 14, and 15. Uh, We already gave thanks to the Lord, so we'll get started. Uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Paul says, looking for that, that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Today's title is called That Blessed Hope. Um, I want you to see in chapter 2, verse 13, that Paul doesn't say just the blessed hope. That's actually how most people read it. In my years in dispensational uh, Bible study, as far as uh, in in, in the dispensational uh, Bible circles, you'd be surprised how often that's misread or misquoted. Paul just doesn't say looking for the blessed hope. He says looking for that blessed hope. And then he says, another way this is, it's, it's taught or read is that the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ is one and the same. But they're not one and the same. They, 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 they're together. They, they, uh, they're, they're a package deal, but they're not one and the same. Because the, look, look at the second part of that, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious, that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, that has to do with his return, his, his, the rapture we call it, the resurrection. His return for the saints of Almighty God. I hope this year, yes, Lord, thank you. Y'all don't know, I pray all day, every day for the Lord to come. So if if prayers are powerful, y'all pray with me. I know Rod doesn't believe in that. Rod said, give me 20 more years, Lord. No, we're going to have a struggle on that, brother. I'm waiting. Come on, Lord. He'll come in his own time. And we we are to pray. By the way, notice, notice, look at verse 13. You see the first word in verse 13? It's looking. You got him. Look at this. We're to, we're to look for. I know you do, Dodie. You probably do as much as anyone here. You, you've lived longer in this sin-cursed world, right? You're saying, and, and you have friends and family who've gone before or are hurting now in, in, in their old age. You understand the plight that I understand hearing from saints who are suffering. We're just like, come on, Lord. And I'm not just talking about for me and my family. I'm talking about for saints I hear from. People are suffering. People are tired of this sin-cursed, Christ-rejecting world. And so we're looking, but we're to look for it. Look for it. When you look for something, you're searching out. You're saying, Lord, come. So that's the right attitude. I know some people want to do it, uh, look for it because they're hurting and so forth, and that's fine. That's, that's, That's legit. But really, what we should be looking for is that blessed hope. It's a knowledge of understanding. Um, let me show you something. Let's, let's go back to verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope, and you're also going to look for, and the glorious appearing of great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. But that issue of the blessed hope, go back to verse chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, start at verse 1. Uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God. By the way, remember I said last week, he starts this epistle off with the issue of servant. The good works have to do with being a servant. Why serve God today? Because we're going to see in verse 14, go back to chapter 2, verse 14. Look at Titus 2, 14. Who gave himself for us that. Why did Christ come and die on the cross for our sins? That he might redeem us from all iniquity. He's our redeemer. Did we sing redeem today? No. But you know, we almost did, right? Because we sang like... He's our redeemer. He's the one who bought us out of sin. But also, not just, you you ever hear somebody say, all that matters is that we all go into heaven, we're saved. It doesn't matter if I'm a Baptist, if I'm this or that or the other. If we're all saved and we're, we're, we're in Christ, that's all that matters. But that's not all that matters. He said to redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. God ordained that we should walk in good works, Ephesians 2.10. That's what being a servant is. Go back to chapter 1. Look at verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle. See, he saw himself as an apostle second and a servant first. 
I was talking with Ryan about Chris. I said, uh, she's my sister in the Lord first. Our relationship is brother and sister in the Lord first, then husband, wife, and then parents to Jada Lynn in that order. You have to see, if you both are saved, you and your husband have to see yourself, or you and your wife have to see yourself as brother and sister in Christ, because that's the relationship that's going to last. Either by death or the rapture, the marriage relationship will cease. You'll know you were married. Chris and I would know we were family and married and so forth. We can even serve the Lord together. We will. You can see the pattern in the Old Testament. But as far as being married, there, we won't be married anymore. They're neither married nor given in marriage in the resurrection. But we will be brother and sister in Christ forever. Well, that's what's going on. He sees himself as a servant first and an apostle next when it comes to God. Now, when he talks to us, he's our apostle. Notice here, an apostle of Jesus Christ, verse 1, according to or in line with the faith, the faith of God's elect. We went through all that in, in, when we did this verse. And the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. What I want you to see in verse one, verse 2, excuse me, that blessed hope is mentioned here. Notice, in hope of eternal life. That's not a hope like, I, I'm wondering if I'm saved or not. Uh-uh. You know you're saved if you've trusted Christ. This hope of eternal life we saw is more than just everlasting life. It's a weight of glory associated with it. It's a, it's a weight of glory, he says in 2 Corinthians 4, weight of glory. What we're going to see is this has to do with reigning with Christ, not just getting to heaven. Every believer, if you trust in Christ, you're going to, you die, you're going to go to heaven, depart with Christ, uh, depart. Um, absent from the body is to be present from the Lord, to depart and be with Christ is far better, Paul says. Every believer will go to heaven when they die or the rapture. This issue of eternal life is more than just everlasting life. It has to do with some glory associated with it. Notice verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Why did Paul bring up this promise? Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Because God wants us to... Go after his promises. Having a child, man, when you make a promise, they remind you about it, don't they? Oh, man, especially ours. I could tell Jada Lynn something. I said, I'm going to do this. You promise, Daddy? Yes. And she holds me to it, man. She holds me to it. Because I'm her father, and my word means a lot to her. And so God the Father makes promises. And he promised himself. He promised his son and his spirit. They made a pact that anyone who's willing to suffer with Christ in this dispensation of grace will also reign with him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that's why, that's why knowing right division is so important. People ask me all the time, Brother Ron, they say two things. Why isn't this taught more in, in other churches? And why should we know this information? Because there's glory on the line. There's reigning on the line. This is an eternal thing. God, they don't teach it because they, Satan doesn't want them to teach it. Because if you teach this, Doty, you will, in the, the, the capacity to endure increases. It'll make a difference. It makes a huge difference. I, Doty. I got so many people. Let me see if I got this brother here. Y'all just don't know. Do you know that people, did I even write it? I didn't even, I'm going to share with you guys. I get so many of these, I, I got to pick and choose. One guy said that teaching the judgment seat of Christ in this glory has changed his whole life. And he's been a believer for years. He says, Ron, it opens up the scriptures. It opens it. It, it motivates me to serve the Lord. I said, that's what it's designed to do. You, oh, we, yeah. Looking for that blessed hope. What is that? Look, notice 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. Why is the mystery of Christ given to the apostle Paul so important? Verse 7, 1 Corinthians 2, 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. 
God's wisdom was displayed in the Old Testament. It was laid out in prophecy. You could read it. You could study it. But there's some wisdom that God kept hidden, kept secret. Notice verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery. Even the hidden wisdom, see, it was hid, which, which God ordained. He had it all in, he had it already before the world unto our what? Glory. Which none of the princes of this world knew. Satan and his henchmen did not know this. For had they known it, verse 8, they would what? They would not have crucified the righteous judge of, judge of glory, the Lord of glory. Listen, Satan would have said, wait a minute. I know what the plan is on the earth. So I'm, I'm put it, trying to put a stop to that. The Antichrist and all that's going to try to stop that fulfillment of that earthly kingdom. But what Satan didn't know is that God was going to use us Gentiles, not, not, not Israel, but us Gentiles, individual Jews and Gentiles in one, to rule and reign in the heavenly places. Had Satan known that, he says, you can have the earth, man. He would have told his guys, lay off of Jesus. Let him have the earth. We'll keep the heavens. They would not. Think about that. Satan spent all his thinking on how can I get rid of this son of God. And had they known what God was going to do to reconcile the heavenly places, he wouldn't, even, wouldn't have laid a hand on him. And he got caught in his own craftiness. And now God has given you and I an opportunity to earn the reigning, to earn it, to suffer with him, to serve him in, in this mystery. Uh, go back with me to, uh, on the way back to Titus. Look at Titus chapter 3. Go to Titus chapter 3. Go to Titus chapter 3. We'll get to this verse in, 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 a, in a little bit in detail. But this issue of hope, it's that blessed hope. It's a specific thing we're to look for. Yes, we're to look for the return of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have people who don't rightly divide wanting the Lord to come. I get people who just learning about our ministry, and they, they've seen one study by me, and I'll say something about the rapture or something. They say, Brother Ron, I believe in, in that pre-tribulation rapture. I'm thankful that God's going to take us home before his wrath is poured out, and they don't know anything about right division. So it's, it's one thing to believe... Uh, Dodie and I talk about Jack Van Impey. He believes in a pre-tribulation rapture. He does. He'll teach it. He'll tell other people to teach it. But he doesn't rightly divide. But he believes in it. So it's more than just looking for the return of our great God and Savior. We're to look for a blessed hope of, of, of reigning with him, a, a hope of glory. Notice in Titus 3, 7. Notice Titus chapter 3, verse 7. That being justified by his, what? Grace. See, God's grace is the only way we can serve him. You ever notice that when Paul talks about the grace of God, he always puts on the back end, the grace of God is so you can serve God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. Paul will make it clear to, to save your soul from hell, it's not of works lest any man should boast and then as soon as you finish thinking about that you, he goes for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works there you go sanctification Dodie right listen unto good works so the moment Paul tells you you're saved by grace alone no works the, the carnal mind goes or the baby spiritual mind the, the baby uh, mind goes well, you're just telling me I can do whatever. I, if I can't lose my salvation, if I don't go to hell no matter what, I can do whatever. You can, but he said good works. In fact, look at, look at, look at Titus. I said Titus 3, 7. It starts in Titus 3, 5, uh, verse 4. Titus 3, 4. And again, I'm going to go into it in detail in a moment. But after that, the kindness and love. By the way, you want a good definition of grace? Right there, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, right? Paul says the grace of God to bring the salvation appeared to all men. Undeserved. Undeserved kindness. Undeserved love, right, Dodie? Undeserved. Unmerited. Right. Can I tell you the greatest thing you could do each morning? You wake up and say, Lord, thank you for your marvelous grace and mercy. I don't deserve it. I've just you right, I'm wrong. I bow my heart to you, O magnificent, almighty God. I do it every morning. 
Because you want to start your day saying, the fact that I'm a the fact that I'm alive today is but by the grace of God. It is. And the mercy of God. That he doesn't give us what we deserve. You know yourself. I know myself and we know each other because we all got this flesh. And just the fact that we're alive, you say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Another day to serve you. Just start your day. It makes your whole day a lot more smooth. You just say, thank you, Lord. I'm telling you. I, I, I learn that more every day of my life in Christ. I'm astounded that he deals with me. Look at this, verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness. Listen, there's nothing you can do to earn God's favor and earn God's love and kindness. It's just because of who he is and what Christ did on the cross because God couldn't do it until Christ fulfilled his part. See, if, if Christ didn't die for your sins, a righteous judge, God Almighty, could not forgive you because he's holy and we're sinners and he can't have sinners in his presence. So he had to come up with something that could fix the problem. We fixed the glitch, like office space. We fixed the glitch. And how God fixed the glitch of sin is he took it upon himself. And now sin doesn't have to be a barrier between us and our father because Jesus Christ, his son, died for us. Listen, that's why he says, not by works, verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his, in line with who he is as the merciful, merciful God. He's mercy. According to his mercy, he saved us. And then in that, in, that, in that process, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, we'll go through that in a moment, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, now that you're saved, how? Now that you're righteous by grace, we should, now this is the second part of it, we should be made heirs according to the hope of what? Eternal life, the hope of it. So what's that, what's that blessed hope? It's that hope of eternal life. Now, obviously, that's more than just your salvation. He already said we're, we're justified by grace. This eternal life is more than just being saved. It is that glory associated with what God called us to, to reign with Christ. But not everybody's going to reign. That's why you have to rightly divide the word. That's why Satan keeps this hid, because he doesn't want God's children to know our father's truth and how to reign. He wants lazy believers. We have to serve him and not just serve him in how we want to. It has to be according to the mystery given to the apostle Paul. That's why you have to rightly divide the word of truth. It has to be the works that Paul the apostle himself did or, or laid out in his scriptures, the Romans through Philemon. All right, let's keep going. Go back to chapter 2, verse 3. Oh, yeah, let me look at a little more of that. Go to Romans chapter 5. We'll go to Romans chapter 5. That blessed hope. Let's look at that blessed hope. Romans chapter 5. I'm astounded. I, can I tell you something? I learn something more about God's word every day. It's, it's crazy. I've read these passages hundreds of times, and yet I could just read it and think about it. And I say, oh, yeah, the, it's in its eyes of your understanding being enlightened. And it happens forever if you allow it. Yeah, forever. it does. By the way, we're still going to be learning about right. our father's word right. all throughout. Because if if God is everlasting and his wisdom is infinite, right. then guess what? We got is we're going to learn about him and his mind forever and ever. The Bible says the Bible just says forever and ever, just in case you. You don't know what forever is. Forever and ever. Amen. Look at, look at Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Every time, see, therefore, being justified by faith, we have what with God? Peace. You have peace with God. Now, you may not feel that peace or know that peace or understand that peace, but the Bible makes it clear, once you get saved, God is not against you. He's not. I 
I may be disappointed in Jada Lynn's decisions as she grows. Even now, you know, I understand she's eight. But I'm never going to be against my daughter. She could be against me. I'll never be against her. My heart as a father won't allow that. That's my baby girl. I'll never, she could hate me. I don't know why she would. I'm raising up. I'm, I'm loving her. But even if she rejected me in rebellion, my heart will always love her. I will always be for her. She'll always have peace with her daddy. That's God. No matter how you're sitting, no matter how you live in your life or not living your life, don't let those religious legalists come and say, oh, ooh, you broke fellowship with God because you, or you didn't do this. No, no, no. You can't break fellowship with God if you're in Christ. You can grieve him. Grieve not the Holy Ghost, Paul says, Ephesians. You can sadden him, but you can't break fellowship because you're in Christ. Notice, you, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's a right now thing. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. The righteous judge has made the way. Think about it. The righteous judge says, you're righteous. You're innocent. I've determined that. Well, how am I innocent, Lord? Oh, I did that too. It'll be like a judge sentencing somebody to death, and then the judge gets off the, the thing, takes his robe off, and says, okay, bailiff, let them go. What, what are you talking about? Let them go. Give me, put the handcuffs on me. Take me out to the, to the chair. I'll die for him. That's what our Lord did. The righteous judge says, guilty, death, let him go. Handcuff me. Take me to the electric. Take me to the cross. Did y'all know he did that with a man? A man named Barabbas. Barabbas. Okay. He was a murderer and a seditionist, causing trouble for the Roman Empire. He was about to be crucified, and Pilate trying to do, Pontius Pilate, he says, I'll trade if you want. Somebody got to die. So and they said, we'll take Barabbas, son of the father. Son of the father. That's a type of the nation of Israel. And this man, he got saved because Christ, the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord, took his place. It's a type of him suffering for the sins of the nation of Israel. That's symbolic. He did trade places with somebody, a guilty man was released so that an innocent man could die in his place. That's the Lord. There, therefore, verse 1, chapter 5, Romans, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Religion and legalism will never tell you that. They'll say you got to do all these things to be right with God. You got to tithe. You got to go to church. You got to get water baptized. You got to go to confession. You got to get, they'll give you all this whole list to be right with God. But in Christ, you're right with God. That word justified means declared righteous. Exactly. Through our, by, by the way, there's more. Verse 2. By whom? Through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have another blessing. By whom also we have access. That, that's a beautiful word. Uh, that's a beautiful word, access. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. God God's gives us his grace, the, the, the truth, but, and we have access to it. But the access, the key to opening that blessing is faith. It's believing what God says in his word. Verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We stand in God's grace. Now, here's what I want you to see. And rejoice in hope of what? The glory of God. You see what Paul is saying? That blessed hope is the glory of God. He's willing to share his glory is what I'm saying. He's going to share it with us. Share it. He wants to give us that position of authority to rule his kingdom like any father would with his sons. And you can rejoice in it. That's what's going to happen. Well, look what Paul says. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. That's a dis this life. 
knowing that tribulation, those troubles that come, work with patience. You can trust God's word. You know he's going to come through. Your sister, Lori, sitting there, Lord, I want to be there. I don't, I don't want to be driving there. We didn't know the sister from Bakersville would come that day. We definitely didn't know she was just saying, oh, I'm going to pick her up. <laughs> I'm gonna say, well, thank you. Lori said, oh, Lord, I want to I be there to hear your word and to be comforted with, and, and in the flesh with these saints. And God, through his wonderful providence and the working of the saints, gets it done. She can learn to trust of the Lord, patience. And patience experience, you, you, you say, oh, I got this. I understand how God works. And experience hope. Knowing you can endure because there's something at the end of that. Her next uh, play is, um, what's the next one? Wizard of Oz. And they're going to go through Dorothy and the Tin Man and the, and the Lion and the Scarecrow and, to and little Toto. They're going to have a little dog on the stage. I don't know. And what they looking for, they all going to go to the end of the road, right? The, the yellow brick road. By the way, that's just stolen from the Bible. The Bible has streets of yellow gold. The Wizard of Oz, there was a man named Job, and he lived in the land of Uz. That's in the book of Job. He lived in the land of Uz. I think, look, was it the land of Oz? Hmm, where they got that? Oh, yeah, they stole that from the Bible, too. I see that stuff in all these things. I just crack up. They're looking to get to the end to the wizard, right, who's supposed to be like God. But in there, he's a phony, right? I saw the one with Richard Pryor. That was funny. That was with Diana Ross and Michael Jackson. But you know what? That's all they were doing was looking forward, hoping to get there, a heart, hoping to get home, hoping to get courage, hoping to get a brain and all this other stuff. What were they doing? They said, if we could just get to the end over there, we're going to get what we're looking for. What God is saying, listen, you endure the trials and tribulations of this life, suffering for this truth, and there's something waiting for you. Now, they got let down. We're not going to get let down. Because what he said, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God in verse 4, and patience, experience, experience, hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. You won't be ashamed at the end of this thing. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Our spirit and the spirit of God connect and through the word of God, prayer, we can endure this thing and get through to the end. And we're almost there. We're almost at the end of this thing. I get stuff every day. People say, Brother Ron, you say the stage is being set. and the, the stage, um, We work the plays. We work these plays, Jada Lynn. The parents have to work plays. And you know what's going on behind the curtain? They'll close that curtain. And you, you can hear all this stuff. It's kind of, it's not too loud, but you can hear they moving the set around. They're setting the stage for the next scene. That happens spiritually too. Paul says the mystery of iniquity doth already work. So, so what's going on in the Middle East? All that stuff you see, it's, it's setting the stage for the return of Christ, for the body of Christ, but about to go, and then the rest of the world going through the wrath. I didn't hear what it was. Hey, <laughs> hi Siri. <laughs> Siri's my girl. Krista calls her my girlfriend. Because I'll say, I can't say it. I'll say, hey, in her name. And she's, yes, here I am. <laughs> I told Krista, Krista was cooking the food this morning. And, and, and I said, you don't have to set that old timer. Just tell Siri. So she yells at her. I can't say it because Siri, she goes, hey, I said, you can talk to Siri nicely. Don't yell at Siri. <laughs> it's, it's for serious. The God is serious. Yeah, we know that. And, and I like they got a little apple with the, with with the bite, a bit, a bit, a bite taken out of the apple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, here's the point. We have that peace with God, and now we know that there's something. I was going to say at the end of the rainbow, right? That's a, that's the old thing with the leprechaun. What's at the end of the rainbow? Gold there, right? Gold. Well, there's always looking forward to something. We have something to look forward to. Let me show you guys that. Go to Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians chapter one. There's, there's a reason to do what we do each day, each week especially, when we come together to encourage one another. Paul was so confident. He'd say stuff like this. The apostle, he'd say, to depart and be with Christ is far better. Mm, to stay here to, to encourage you guys, 
is more needed, so I know I'll stay. You'll say, God, you know, I'll stay. We'll stay. Let's do this together, Father. Yeah, for a while. Because God, Paul understood the mind of Christ that ministering to his saints, to his people, to his children, to your brothers and sisters in Christ was what God wanted us to do. He got it. To the point he could be in prison and says, yep, I'll just pray God opens up a door of utterance, get us out of here, and we'll be there to see you. And guess what God did? Open up that door, got out there to see him. Paul told the Romans, he says, that I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. And at the end he says, you know what? I'm certain that we're going to do this. Because he understood God's will. If you're going to go and you want to edify and build up and serve the Lord by serving saints, God says, that's exactly what I want you to do. And you, you'll do it. Notice here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That's what I was talking about as you grow in your understanding of God's word. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling. People say, Brother Ron, it's just enough that we're saved. I say, no, 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 that's not why God saved you. People say, oh, I'll be happy just to hold open the doors of heaven. I say, well, then that's God. may God give you what you want. Uh, 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 you're going to be a doorman in heaven? God didn't call the body of Christ to be doorman in heaven. Nothing against doorman, but that's not his calling. The hope of his calling, he explained right here in Ephesians chapter 1, really nine down, but let me, let me read this. What is the hope of his calling? Verse 18. Why did God call the body of Christ? And what is, and what the richest of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Listen, the Lord Jesus, we're his inheritance. We're the Father's inheritance. He has a purpose for us. Verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power? By the way, the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. You know, Paul's saying God has put all of his power to work in the lives of the saints when you believe his word. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 he talks about, it, um, I want to get the words. I got like four verses in my brain right now. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Paul lays it out. 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Yeah, this is it. Because when ye received the word of God, which you heard of us, the Thessalonians heard it from Paul, Silas, and Timotheus, Timothy. Ye received it not as the word of what? Man, you ever hear people say, ah, uh, the Bible was written by man. It's just a book of a man's writings. That's crazy. Yes, it was written by men, 40 plus different men over a long hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and hundreds of times, consistent message. But Paul makes it clear that these words aren't the word. They are not the words of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Notice verse 13, for this cost also thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God, which you heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men. By the way, Paul was telling them things that wasn't written in the Old Testament scriptures. If he's teaching a mystery doctrine, they can't go and look at the Old Testament and say, oh, yeah, yeah, where, where is that at now? He's telling them things that wasn't written down in scriptures. They really trusted the Apostle Paul when you read this. But notice. You received it not as the word of men. This, this book is not men's word, but as it is in truth, the what? The word of God. When you're dealing with this Bible, you're dealing, Denise, when we get that King James Bible over there, it's going to have an impact. It's going to have an impact. One Bible, because these people appreciate it. It's like gold. It's like food. And it's going to impact some people. And they're watching our ministry, too. It's, it's going to change their lives. Praise the Lord. He says, as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually, it's an energy that, that it's like a, dy a dynamite. I like how one brother uh, explained it. When they do what they call controlled uh, demolition. See this in Vegas a lot. They do a lot of building. You could just put dynamite anywhere and blow the building up, right? I could do that. No, probably I couldn't. I can't do nothing like that stuff. Some, any, any, any capable man who got any hands, skills with his hands, could put some dynamite and just blow a building up. Pieces will go everywhere. People will die and stuff. But what these engineers do, structural engineers, they place them in certain parts, in the foundation. And they'll have that building just collapse, boom. And nothing will hardly fly out. 
Why? Because they used the dynamite in an effective way, effectual. So it's not just blowing some stuff up. I could do that. It's men who are trained engineers who say, all right, this structure can go down boom, like that. That's how God's word works. It has a precision, a laser-like precision that can get stuff done. Notice, he says, but as it is in truth, uh, 2.13, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that what? You have to believe God's word for it to work. You have to have childlike faith for it to work. God's will is that all men be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. But why aren't all men saved? Why are the majority of men lost over the ages? Because they choose not to believe God's word. Choice, free will, yep. God can't allow you to reign as the, right, as the righteous judge. The Lord can't allow you to reign if you don't believe his word through fall. It would be an unrighteous thing. Well, look what he says here. Verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? See, it's God working in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's the same power, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ. Why does Paul call Jesus here Christ? Suffering and the glory. When he raised him from the dead. You know God is the only one who has power to raise from the dead. That's what makes him God. Mankind, you hear, you see these stupid articles, scientists raise up, they didn't do anything, they didn't raise nobody from the dead. They, they got some energy, God's electromagnetic energy to do something. The next time someone is raised from dead, like, like bodily like that, be the Antichrist, or people that he gives power to, Satan's gonna, listen, man will never be able to do that the way God, well, God will let them do it then, it'll be so they can believe a lie. But God raises the dead. And Paul says, why you even marvel that it's a big deal that God raised the dead? He told the guy in the book of Acts. What makes God God is he raised the dead. Let's keep it going. He says, whom he raised from the dead, uh, excuse me, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. That has to do with his position as the king of kings and lord of lords. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion, all these different uh, uh, ranks of authorities and power, and every name that is named, that's for the rest of the body of Christ right there. So our brothers and sisters who are heirs of God, they'll, they'll, have, they'll have a part, but it won't be reigning with Christ. Not only in this world, speaking when Christ comes and rules over the earth, but also that which is to come in the heavens, and hath put all things under his feet. He's, he's the ultimate authority and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Why did God exalt Jesus Christ so high for us, to the church? Which one? Because I got a question in the Q&A, the Facebook Q&A, about Paul persecuting the church of God, and a brother said, who are these people? I thought the body of Christ started with Paul. Well, the, body, the church which is his body, what we're gonna see, there's different churches in scripture. Church just means a, a congregation or an assembly. So there was the church in the wilderness, Moses' church, Christ, Messianic church, I will build my church in the gates of hell. This is the church which is his body. That's why we're called the body of Christ. Did that preacher, it's been two or three years now, did he find the body of Christ in the Gospels? Tell him, keep looking. I, I think he stopped looking. Yeah, I think he stopped looking. Because you won't find the body of Christ as far as this particular church today. Because it's not in the four Gospels. The body of Christ began in Acts 9 with the salvation of Saul of Tars Tarsus, the Apostle Paul. In me first, Jesus Christ might show for all long suffering. People think the body of Christ started in Acts 2, but nothing new started in Acts 2. That was the kingdom church. All right, let's keep going. He says, verse number 23, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. How does Jesus Christ rule and reign over the, the entire heavens? It's through us, the body of Christ. We're his fullness. We complete him. You know how you say to your wife, woman, you complete me. Well, he says to the body of Christ, which he looks to as like a wife, he says, you complete me. You, full, you make me full. We're dearly beloved because he can't live without us. Let's say he can. He doesn't desire to live without us. God can do anything. We, he don't need us. He loves us in spite of ourselves, okay? 
All right, uh, go over to Colossians. Uh, Colossians chapter number, I didn't, why didn't I write that down? Look at Colossians chapter uh, 3. Colossians chapter 3, that's what I want. Colossians chapter 3. And look with me, if you will, down to verse 23. Yeah, Colossians 3.23. When he says, looking for that blessed hope, it, it's the glory of God. It's that hope of eternal life. We're going to see ultimately as we come down to the end, it has to do with reigning with him. It's not just enough going to heaven. He call, it's his calling, the hope of his calling, hope of his calling. And we're to look for it. Notice here, verse 23, Colossians 3, 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily or, or with all your heart. That's what heartily means, with all your heart. As to the Lord, as to the righteous judge and not unto men. You know, if you start looking at serving God by looking at the person you're serving, that could get old real fast sometimes. Because they're not perfect. They don't treat, you know, they have flesh, you have flesh. But you got to look past the person and say, Lord, I'm doing this for you. Yeah, okay, you're the righteous judge. You're, okay, I, I got it. But he wants you to understand something. Look at verse 24. Knowing, so you're supposed to know this, knowing that of the Lord, of that righteous judge. So anytime you see the Lord, just think judgment seat of Christ. When you see this right here, Lord, it equals the righteous judge he's the only righteous judge in existence attorneys will tell you we don't have a justice system we have a legal system people aren't made whole people are wrong are, aren't uh, made whole or righted by the courts we still waiting to get made whole that guy still owes that money years ago we ain't gonna see that money I said last week they would have made him our butler right if he couldn't pay you my butler pay your look the righteous judge is gonna make everything right and fair and equal but that has to do with the judgment seat of Christ. See, at the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to give you something of Christ. Now, what is he going to give you? Notice verse 24. Knowing that of the Lord, ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. The reward of the inheritance. Not just the inheritance. Not just living in the heavenly places and in a new body. But there's something more for those who serve the Lord Christ. He gives them the reward of the inheritance. Notice. The reward of the inheritance. Why? For ye serve the Lord Christ. And why did he why didn't he say the Lord Jesus there? Because he's saying he the judge is going to give it to those who suffered with him in the mystery. But what if you choose, Dodie, you mentioned how how you mentioned choice, right? What if you choose not to serve him as a believer? Verse 25. But he that doeth wrong. And by the way, if you choose not to serve him, you're doing wrong. That's wrong. So you do wrong, fine shall receive for the wrong which we, he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. You know what he's saying? You could choose not to serve me. And when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, I'll give you what you deserve. Loss of reigning. Loss of reward. Fine. And you won't reign with him. That's what that verse is talking about. That's it's going to be awful. You're going to be ashamed. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Go over to, it's, D Dody said for the, they love to hear your voice, by the Doty said, that's going to be awful. You got it, Doty. You understand that, don't you? Ryan and I talk, we talk about it all the time. People don't appreciate the loss at the judgment seat of Christ. They don't. They're not taught it. Oh, we, I, yeah, next week, honey, remind me of the, the guy who said about me teaching about the judgment seat of Christ. It just, we got multiple people tell us that, though. They say, it changed my life. I say, it's supposed to. Look at 2 Corinthians. It's not even taught amongst dispensational. This is crazy, man. We're in the last days, man. Wow. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9. Wherefore we labor. Labor is hard work. We labor that whether present, in his presence, or absent from him, you hear, we may be accepted of him. I mean, you want to be accepted. It's school time, right? I had a dear brother. He's a dear, dear brother back in Minnesota. And his oldest son is going off to school, to college. And he, he's having a hard time with it. The boy's he's going to college. He says, Ron, pray for me. 
me and my boy, we've been together his whole life up to this point. And he, it's making me tear up because he, he said, pray for me. I'm having separation anxiety because this is my boy. And he's going off the school. I, I, oh, I mean, you know, the Lord. Anyway, she ain't leaving the house. <laughs> She's going to do it online, of course. <laughs> but he's feeling that. He's going, my, my, my son, my, my, my baby boy, who's now a young man, is going off. And he's, he's having a hard time. I can understand that a little bit. I don't have, I'm not there yet, but I could feel him. He's feeling like, whoa. I know. And you know one of the things though, but when when he when when he got when his son got accepted at that college, it was it was a bittersweet thing for brother, for the brother. Because he was happy his son got accepted. You know, you get that acceptance letter, oh, I'm in there. But part of him as dad going, Oh, my son's going off, he's leaving the nest now. We may be accepted of him. Why? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And he doesn't call it the judgment seat of of, of, of even the Lord or Jesus, what are we going to be judged on is how we suffered with him, Christ. And he's going to dole out the glory associated with that. That's why he calls the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body. It's talking about what we do down here. According to or in line with he had done, or she had done, ladies, that go for you sisters too, whether it be what? Good or bad. Let me ask you a question. By doing bad, by doing wrong, who's bad? You're doing wrong, Michael Jackson said that. By doing bad, by doing wrong, why would the Lord, if you did bad and you did wrong, why would he say, okay, well done, here's, the, here's, here's your crown of righteousness? No, he won't do that. He'll say, I love you. Welcome to heaven. You wanted to be holding the gates of heaven? Up? All right. Go ahead. There you go. You've earned it. Go hold the gates open. And you know how ashamed you would be because angels come back and forth through there. And we're higher beings in that time. Now, you know I'm just being, but they're going to, every name that is named, he's going he's gonna to give them a, a position where they serve him. No more sin up there. But the point is, you wasted your life down here. Serve him in the mystery of Christ. He says, whoever is, whoever is going to be greatest in the kingdom will be servant of all. So find out all these opportunities to serve the Lord in the mystery, and you know he, that's the balance of the Lord. If, you, if you're the servant of all down here, you'll be great. So how, how great you'll be, how much you serve down here. That's the principle. Yeah. That's fair. That's, that's how the Lord works. Verse 11, as we come down to end, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. I've heard, this is the truth, I gotta, I've heard Pauline dispensational brothers teach, I heard them, and, and, and this is, I, I, I respect this man a little bit, a little bit, and I think he's one of the better t teachers on certain things, he doesn't teach the judgment seat, but he said that this is Paul talking about to lost men, that the Lord is a terror to lost men, that's just the opposite. Yes, he writes to the believers. And you know what? Lost men don't, they don't have a true fear of God because they just think, act like he don't exist. This is talking about saints. By the way, Paul uses terror in Romans 13. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. He wants you to see terror associated with don't do evil, do good. Look, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also manifest in your. He's talking to believers here. When Paul says fear and trembling, it's that reverence, how, how, how we say it, you fear electricity. You should, by the way. That's how God shows his power. Like a healthy fear. A healthy fear. That's it. I know that if I put my foot in a bucket of water and do all this, I'm, you know, <laughs> that would, I fear that, right? Bye, I get fried. But I'm not sitting around, oh, it's an outie. It's an outlet. No, I say, you know what, that's an outlet. And when our, when our daughter was crawling around, we put these little things in there so she wanted to put her little tiny finger in there to get electrocuted. We fear it, but it's a healthy fear. It's a fear that's not paralyzing. It's a fear of, I respect your power of electricity, Lord. And now I know it's, it's how he puts his power on display in the world. Well, anyway, we got to come down to the end here. Um, was, I just wanted to uh, go with me to, you know what? 
Let's end over in 2 Timothy 4. This is a good place to end, 2 Timothy 4. Because that hope of glory has to do with reigning with Christ. 2 Timothy says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. 2 Timothy 2, 12. Well, notice how Paul ends his last book before he dies. Look at uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse uh, 6, and we'll end. 2 Timothy 4, 6. For I am now ready to be offered. He saw himself as a sacrifice. And the time of my departure is at hand. His soul was in departing, Genesis 35. Your soul departs like an airplane taking off. You know when people have those near-death experiences? What's happening is, just like a baby being born with an umbilical cord, God is so wonderful. He'll give you a physical to show the spiritual. So when a baby is born into this world, I remember Jada Lynn was born. It was a process, a labor, a voice, more for Krista, I would say. You know, she went through it. I just watched and worried. Rachel, Rachel and Richard, that's right. Thank you, Mother. I got all these things. They just had their baby two days ago. Yeah, hard labor. Hard labor, yeah. We'd see her. She was wilding. Anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, give, give, them a, give them a call or something. Uh, that's right. They just had that, the baby. Well, in that labor process, when that baby comes out, it just don't just pop. It's this cord connected to it called an umbilical cord. And then the doctor said, come here, Mr. Knight. Your daddy says, cut that. I was like, really? He said, cut it. It's weird cutting that thing. And he's like, it's all right. He put the thing. The man, had, he, he, he birthed hundreds and hundreds of babies. He says, cut it right here. Well, the same happens in death. There's a process of it. Solomon says that silver cord is not broken. That spirit. And when people's soul is departing, if that's not broken, they come back. And that's why people have all these experiences. And they say, I saw them working on me. They were putting the thing in. It's, it's a true phenomenon because their soul, the Lord says, leaving them half dead. He, the Lord Jesus uses that for the Good Samaritan. He left them half dead. The guy was about, and he, he was saved. That happens for real. The point is, he says, I'm, my departure's at hand. Paul knows he's going to die soon. He's not talking about a plane flight. He's talking about dying. Verse 7, I have fought a good fight. There was a fight yesterday, Mayweather <laughs> McGregor. We were at we were at her. Um, we we were at our what's called. No, I'm not saying nothing. Okay. Well, we were at her play. We we couldn't see it anyway. It was a big thing because one guy was fighting from another thing. Uh, but but some people say it was a good fight. Well, Paul had a good fight. It was a spiritual fight. He says, "I have finished my course. God laid out a course for him, and he finished what God had pl the plan God put for him." We talk about courses. I have kept the faith. He did not let it go. He didn't let it fall to the ground, as it were, as it says with Samuel. Didn't let the words of God fall to I love that. It says about little Samuel, he did not let any of God's word fall to the ground. That, that visual, it's like God is throwing the word down and Samuel is like catching him, right? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Paul, does, he didn't do that. Now why? Verse 8, henceforth, from here on, there is laid up for me. I can imagine the angels. God is getting them all prepared. And they're just doing their job, laying up the, putting them in store for us who served them. The angels, heaven is getting prepared for us. They talk about when a dignitary goes over to another country, they prepare for, for, for months and months ahead and make everything nice for them. I could see the angels preparing for the body of Christ to be reunited. Taking a long time. I know, Dodie, who you telling? <laughs> Who you telling? And I'm I, and I'm 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 half your age, and I'm waiting on them. I know you, I know you ready. But you know what, Dodie? It's it's the Lord is at hand. That's what Paul says. We wait on him, right? You know what? I, don't I tell you this almost every day, Dor? Dear, I say, I want the Lord to come back right now this year. But if He decides to tarry, that's His infinite wisdom, and I'm I'm okay with it, right? You know what? That means He. Who am I to judge the Lord? Who am I to sit and judge? Lord, if you don't come, that's between you and you. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Thank you, because I trust you more than I trust me. Obviously, if he tarries, there's a reason. But I say, come, Lord. Come, Lord. Well, what's going to happen? Let's end here. Henceforth, verse 8, there's laid up for me a crown. Who wears a crown? A ruler. A crown of righteousness, faith and love, remember, which the Lord, the 
righteous judge shall give me at that day. And the most beautiful part about this is, and not to me only, Paul says, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And that appearing was, appearing was defined in chapter 1 as that mystery gospel given to the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. If you love that message of the mystery and you serve him in it and willing to suffer in that service, you know there's a crown of righteousness. When Paul says, looking for that blessed hope, that's what it is. And you know by serving him and doing what he says, there's that crown of righteousness, that glory of God that you're going to share in. If that doesn't motivate you to serve the Lord, nothing will. Jada Lamb, when she does her play, she comes down, she says, Daddy, did you see me? I said, did I see you? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much only watching you up there. <laughs> daddy, did I do good on stage? You were the best, darling. You were the best. Well, thank you, Daddy. I know my words have profound impact in her little heart. So I'm going to tell her, you're the best out there because you're my girl. I was watching everybody else, too, but I kept my eye on Jada. You know? <laughs> it was a nice play. But anyway, we got to end. If you don't know the joy of having your sins forgiven, don't go another day not knowing for sure because you're not promised another day. Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again that third day. That's proof that what he did was sufficient for you. Why don't you trust him by faith? No works. But speaking of no works for salvation, then we are to get to work. Get to work? No, that's what King David said in his song, right? Get to work. And how do we serve the Lord to good works? In the mystery of Christ. If you don't have a ministry to be a part of, that's what we're here for, even from afar. You could be helpers together with us in the Lord. All right? And uh, we'll end on that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your marvelous grace. We thank you for the love and mercy you've given us and kindness you've given us in Christ. Father, let us never take that for granted. May we have the heart of those folks in Africa who just want one Bible, one King James Bible, and that's precious to them. It's life-changing. May we feel that way about your precious holy word that we can get pretty easily today here in America. Thank you for that. Thank you for that blessing. It's a blessing that we were born in this country. And may we use our blessed, blessedness to help those who are less fortunate. And we thank you for the opportunity to do that. Thank you for the opportunity to share with other saints here as well. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.